we'll kind of try to get all your questions answered tonight and get you guys ready for that baby that's coming. Um, and like I said, we'll kind of go through a lot of stuff, but have some time at the end for questions. So um, feel free to jot anything down. Um, and congratulations. This is kind of one of the most exciting times of your life. Um, my little one is now 15 months old and the time goes by very, very fast. Um, and kind of almost a blur to those days when she was first born. But kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about is getting ready for baby's arrival, what happens when he or she arrives, getting ready to go home, feedings, common concerns, kind of hopefully enough stuff to kind of get some questions answered. So one of the biggest things that you may or may have not been thinking about is who the baby's doctor is going to be. It's kind of one of those choices in your life that um, could potentially be a decision that you're going to have with your child for the next 20 years. So it's definitely something you want to think about. Um, I always recommend that if you, you know, you're not sure who to pick for your baby's doctors, ask around. Sometimes families and friends can be really great resources um, and they've kind of been there. They know um, what to look for and so they might be able to give you some really great, um, great advice or insight. Sometimes insurances too may have kind of their preferred list. Um, so that's always something to think about. And a lot of pediatrician offices in towns, especially children's physicians who I work for, um, we do free get to know you visits at our offices. Um, and so we really encourage families to think about meeting with the person that you think may or may not be um, your child's pediatrician. That way you can at least kind of get to know them, talk to them a little bit before the day comes and you're kind of maybe hard pressed to kind of decide on someone. Um, some of the things to think about is um, looking at where uh, the pediatrician trained, making sure they're board certified. Uh, location sometimes is key too because you don't always necessarily want to be traveling 30 minutes to get to doctor's visits because there are quite a few that first few years of life. Also looking at office hours, appointment availability. Some offices are fuller than others. Um, some offices have extended hours, evening hours, weekend hours. Those are all things to think about so that hopefully you don't have to miss too much work for well child care visits. And then also um, kind of asking, what do you do if my child's sick in the middle of the night? I have questions. I don't know what to do. Those are all really good things to just kind of ask and see how that prospective office handles those sorts of things. Some families look into baby classes, um, childbirth laws, breastfeeding classes, those are all things that kind of help get you prepared even more. Um, if nothing else, I recommend the hospital tours. They do free tours, usually with a group of people, so at least you kind of know where the birthing floor is. You kind of know how the rooms are set up, um, and it might just make you a little more comfortable on the day that you have to go in so it's not so unexpected when you don't know where to go or what um, the environment's going to be like when you're in the hospital. And thinking about baby essentials, of course the definite things that you have to have before the day the baby arrives is definitely a car seat to get the baby home with. Whether or not you need a stroller or carrier, um, those are things to kind of think about, but definitely car seat, having some diapers at home, wipes, where's baby going to sleep, what are they going to sleep in, um, some babies like a bouncy seat or a swing. Um, in addition to being held, potentially a monitor for their room, where are you going to change the baby? If you're planning on breastfeeding, um, having a pump uh, and feeding supplies ready to go. And then preparing your home as well, making sure baby's room at least is set up with a place for them to sleep and maybe a changing table, making sure the smoke detectors are working in your house, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide detectors, are working as well because those are things that you don't want to have be surprised um, and then make sure you at least have some food and drinks in the fridge the freezer so that you're not feeling rushed to have to go to the grocery store the day you get home with your baby what to bring the big day definitely you want to make sure you have everything for mom dad clothes supplies whatever you think you're going to need for a couple days in the hospital of course, you want to make sure you have your camera so you can get some nice pictures when the baby is born. Things to remember because it's kind of a blur and it goes by really fast. Definitely have to have a car seat. And then I would think about um, an outfit if you have pictures, you know, that are going to be taken in the hospital or some people want kind of a special outfit for going home. Once you arrive at the hospital, 
um, either in labor or if you have a scheduled delivery, they will get you checked in and they'll always ask you that day if they don't have in their, have in their records who the baby's doctor is going to be. Because once the baby is born, the hospital automatically calls the pediatrician for your baby. So it's nothing you have to worry about. That's something you can kind of cross off your list. All you have to worry about is having the baby. Once that baby is born, then the nurses are great about calling the pediatrician, giving them important information, and then the pediatrician will be by for sure within 24 hours, um, and usually a lot sooner than that, to check out the baby. And in the hospital, though, kind of what happens after the baby is born. Usually once that baby is born, You'll get to spend a little bit of time with the baby, depending on um, how delivery went, how the, you and the baby are doing. Um, but one of the big things that they first do is when the baby comes out, they suction out the mouth, the nose, make sure they get out some of those secretions. Some babies are crying, some babies are not right away. So they usually kind of stimulate them, usually by drying. And you'll think it may be a little rougher at times, but really it's not too bad. It just kind of stimulates to kind of get those lungs moving um, and get their breathing up to par. They do what's called APGAR scores at one minute and five minute. And these look at several different things to kind of overall see how the baby's doing. So it looks at the baby's color. It looks at their tone. Are they active or are they just laying there really limp? They look at their breathing, heart rate, um, and kind of it gives us a higher score. It means that the baby's doing great. They're vigorous, they're alert, they're crying, they're breathing great, their color's good. Um, and a lower score may then mean um, the baby might need further intervention uh, by a nurse or a doctor. The nurses uh, at some point will take the baby to the warmer head to toe exam. They'll weigh them, they'll measure them, they will um, check their temperature, just kind of once over they'll listen to their heart, their lungs, um, make sure the baby is stable and doing well. Right after birth they also get um, a few things done to them. The eye ointment is an antibiotic eye ointment because babies are at risk for potentially getting a disease if mom is a carrier in the vagina. So like a like a chlamydia, gonorrhea sort of a thing. So the babies get eye ointment after they're born um, to prevent any sort of infection. Um, they also get a vitamin K injection, which is really important. Babies are born with livers that are somewhat immature, and it takes a little while for their livers really to get going. And so one of the risks of all babies is um, bleeding after birth. And so we give them a shot of vitamin K to kind of jumpstart the liver a little bit and to make it so that they don't have those bleeding issues. So that's something that's really important after birth. And then we also give the first hepatitis B vaccine after birth. Um, they respond very well to it. They don't get fevers or any um, anything like that with that injection. And that really came apart um, by doing that vaccine after birth because some moms, especially those who don't get good prenatal care or who have hepatitis B, whether they know it or not, babies are at um, much higher risk of getting hepatitis B during delivery from mom who's hepatitis B positive. And that can really cause severe hepatitis B disease in the child. And once you get hepatitis B, it's not curable. So we find by doing that vaccine right away at birth really, really decreases um, the chance that a baby would get hepatitis B from their mother. So it's kind of something universal and standard and is a really great vaccine um, that's needed for our children as they get older. So kind of one of them gets kind of knocked out of the way uh, when they're born. They also check their blood sugar. Um, this is especially important too if a mom has uh, gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy. And if they have higher blood sugars during pregnancy, the baby also gets a little bit of higher sugars in their blood. And so the baby kind of has more insulin on board when they're born and are subject to a lower blood sugar. If all of a sudden they go from getting a lot of mom's sugar when they're inside you and then they're born and they don't have that sugar stimulation, then some babies can have can have low blood sugar. So we watch those pretty close to um, the first, first couple hours usually. Um, and that might be involved just one heel poke to get a little blood to check their blood sugar, or it may be several depending upon the number. 
Um, and then usually after they've been stable for a few hours, the breathing's good, their temperature is good, then they'll get their first bath at the hospital. While you're in the hospital, the baby really is monitored pretty darn close um, the whole time that they're there, and especially more so the first 24 hours. So in the hospital, they get vitals taken on a routine basis, their pulse, their um, respiratory status, their temperatures, we check their weight. All babies lose weight after they're born. They're kind of born with a little excess, and so it's totally normal for your baby to lose weight, so it's nothing to worry about. And some babies, it's okay to lose up to 10% of their birth weight. But one of the things that we monitor close is um, how much weight they're losing. So that's kind of something that we watch very closely. Um, in the hospital, we watch how many poopy diapers they have, how many wet diapers they have, make sure those things are starting to pick up. And then, then we look at feeding, whether it's bottle or breastfeeding, making sure they're tolerating those okay. Um, and the baby gets an exam every day by the pediatrician until they get ho go home, kind of like the mom gets an exam every day by her doctor. The babies before they go home get a hearing screen. Um, some babies are born with congenital hearing loss and it can pick it up in the newborn period. But on the flip side, that's not very common at all. And some babies actually fail their hearing screen in the hospital, but they do not have hearing loss. Babies lived in fluid for nine months, and so sometimes they get some fluid behind their ears. And if they were to fail the hearing screen in the hospital before they go home, one, the hospital automatically rechecks it a second time before the baby goes home. But if they were to still fail the hearing screen at that point, then uh, the pediatrician would order a repeat hearing screen, um, and we do those at Children's. They do them at some other places as well in town. And honestly, I think probably at least eight or nine times out of 10, the hearing passes and everything is good. Um, it's not too terribly often that a baby will have congenital hearing loss, but if they do have it, it's great to be picked up early because then we can get services going, um, ENT visits, um, and uh, kind of try to limit any um, trouble they might have because of that. All babies after 24 hours of age also get a heel stick for some blood in the hospital to look at a newborn screen. Newborn screen tests some more rare metabolic diseases, but metabolic diseases that need to be treated right away. So that's why they're done in the newborn period. And they test for quite a few things in Nebraska. And occasionally we do have some positives. Um, so this is kind of a great additional testing um, because by then treating those kids earlier rather than waiting potentially weeks or months for symptoms to, to develop, we can sometimes prevent complications from those diseases. So that's done in the hospital after 24 hours of age and we get those results back by the two week visit. And then we watch the babies closely for jaundice, which is the yellowing of the skin. That's kind of the hospital and the pediatrician's job in the hospital, mom and dad's job in the hospital, bond with the baby, feed the baby, try to rest as much as you can, ask lots of questions, um, kind of try to at least start to figure things out. And just remember too, in the hospital, it's overwhelming and you feel like you don't wanna miss it all, but you definitely wanna get some rest too because in the hospital you have lots of helpers there and at home you might have helpers too, but um, it's a little different in the hospital and so it's okay to kind of limit visitors while you're settled in and kind of getting these feedings figured out and the baby figured out um, and it's okay to have them wait till you get home. So don't feel guilty about that. Circumcision for boys would be done in the hospital before going home. This has been a topic of debate for many, many years, and there really is no right or wrong answer in terms of circumcision. It ultimately is parental choice. Um, there is some thought that circumcised boys, one, definitely uh, it is easier to keep circumcised boys cleaner than uncircumcised boys. That is very true. Um, and there is some, some studies done, especially kind of more the African regions where HIV is much more prevalent, that circumcised boys have less risk of getting HIV just because, you know, that foreskin is removed. Aside from that, really, it's definitely parental choice. Um, 
it's just something you kind of have to talk about and talk to your doctor about if you have questions. Usually those are performed by the OB or the pediatrician, it just depends. And um, then it is monitored by the nurses in the hospital and they kind of show you how to clean and um, what to watch for. And then the pediatrician resumes that care when you guys go home from the hospital. So feedings. There's also, you know, kind of um, some quandra sometimes, breastfeeding versus formula. Again, this is really parental comfort, parental choice. The American Academy of Pediatrics definitely recommends breastfeeding, or breast milk, I should say, for the first year of life. But there sometimes there are a lot of maternal factors that really dictate the ability to breastfeed. And formula these days have come a long way and are pretty darn good. Breast milk overall probably is still the easiest to digest. Um, the formulas try really hard to kind of get the same fat content, nutrient content as breast milk, but it's still hard to get kind of it equal 100%. The studies are definitely out there that children who are breastfed tend to have less infections their first year of life, but all of that kind of depends on if they're in daycare, if they're around smoke, and kind of a lot of other things as well. But definitely, um, if you're breastfeeding, most kids need to eat at least every two to three hours. Some will want to feed every hour, and it just kind of depends. Formula, usually they are spaced out more to every three to four hours because breast milk is easier to digest. And you really have to watch those feeding cues, especially the breastfed babies, the first several days of life. And so, um, those are going to be the signs where they start to root. They start to look for things to suck on. They're waking up. And so they may not be crying, but a lot of babies, especially breastfed babies, when they wake up, it probably needs that they need to eat. They might kind of be sucking on the fingertips. They might be smacking their lips. Usually if it gets to the point that they're crying in hunger, it's, it's to the point that they are overly hungry, it's kind of more of a late sign, usually just waking up, starting to go after the lips, or starting to go after their fingers, smacking those lips. Those are the early signs that the baby's getting hungry and almost the best time to get baby latched on to eat. And breastfeeding can be a very wonderful experience, but it also is difficult and sometimes is the hardest work that you will have to do with that baby. In the hospital, there's lots of resources. Nurses are great resources, pediatricians, they have lactation consultants at the hospital to kind of work with you. It is a learning experience for baby. Babies know how to suck when they're born. They kind of have that reflex, or that, that reflex, but they don't know how to latch on properly. So it takes work. And it takes work for the moms too, just to get their baby latched on. Um, so that it doesn't hurt, so that they're getting as much milk as possible. Um, so it's really something you gotta work on, and it's not gonna, most of the time anyway, it's not gonna be just the easy thing through the first day. It takes work sometimes for weeks, if not months even. Breastfed babies initially get colostrum, which is kind of the early milk. It's digested very quickly. Sometimes they eat more frequently because of that, but this is thicker milk, it's very nutrient rich, and it's the pre-milk as um, we're kind of waiting for uh, the rest of the milk to come in, which usually comes in between days three to five, um, and definitely nursing more often helps that breast milk come in just a little quicker even. Sometimes babies initially when they're breastfeeding will feed for 45 minutes, um, that becomes more efficient as your milk comes in. So initially kind of expect longer feedings um, and it will get better over weeks as the milk really comes in and they're more efficient. And they definitely need to eat more often uh, the first several days. Jaundice is something that we watch for very closely as well and definitely in more in breastfed babies than formula fed babies because jaundice is where you kind of get the yellow of the skin, the eyes, and it's caused by increased bilirubin in the blood. So when we test for jaundice, we actually test the bilirubin level in the baby's blood. There's a couple different ways it can be tested. It can be tested by a blood test, usually just a little heel poke, or transcutaneous where they kind of just run this 
this little machine over the baby. And we watch for risk factors that can put the baby at a higher risk for jaundice. Certain blood types can have a higher risk, so we monitor that. And we usually we know all about that in the hospital. Babies who are a little premature, um, their liver even takes a little bit longer to really get going, and so they're at risk for um, more jaundice than a term baby is. Poor feeding, weight loss. They, babies get rid of kind of this bilirubin stuff through pooping, and you poop when you're eating. And so some babies who either aren't eating enough or they're nursing and mom's milk is just really struggling to come in and they're not getting much and they're getting a little dehydrated, they're not having many poopy diapers, they're not having many wet diapers, those babies are at risk for jaundice. And so sometimes if we have a baby whose bilirubin level is increasing, we need to get more fluids in them so they're pooping so they get rid of that jaundice stuff. Um, and so that's where sometimes with our breastfed babies we may have to give them a little bit of formula supplementation each case is a little bit different, but when you hear bilirubin and jaundice, just kind of those are the things that we're watching for. All babies will have a little bit elevated in elevation in their bilirubin level in the first few days. That's pretty normal. We expect it, but we watch it really close. Too high of a level causes something called chronicterus, which is um, uh, can damage the brain, and so we watch those levels to make sure that they don't get too high. Chronicterus is not very common because we monitor these things so close. Um, and we oftentimes, if we feel like a baby's bilirubin level is jumping too high or getting a little more concerning to us, we can treat the baby with something called like a billy blanket or billy lights, which is just where they lay on this glowing blanket or they have these special lights over them and that helps the skin and the body break down that bilirubin faster. So it can seem like a scary thing if it gets too high, but it's definitely something that your pediatrician watches very close. So it um, rarely causes any problems um, other than sometimes the inconvenience of having to put a baby under, under uh, bilirubin lights. But thankfully that's a home thing and um, it doesn't involve having, usually having to go to the hospital. So those are kind of things that we monitor pretty close in the hospital. So once it's time to go home, usually a vaginal delivery, they'll let you go home in about two days. C-section, usually three. Once you're home, the biggest suggestions I can make is try to get some naps and sleep. A lot of moms will go home and be like, okay, I have a baby, but now I'm home. I gotta get laundry done. I gotta make meals. I gotta keep up to date. I gotta get pictures up. I gotta get, you know, everyone updated on the baby. Well, that can be somewhat stressful and you're going to be sleep deprived. The baby's not going to know it's night. We need to sleep. So definitely, I really encourage you to get sleep when the baby sleeps. Take naps. doesn't matter. It's day, at night. Whenever you get a chance to rest, take advantage of it. The baby's going to want to eat often, every two to three hours. But some breastfed babies will want to eat every hour, especially depending on how your milk is coming in. So you may be you may be feeding a baby fairly often. And you really have to think about yourself. You wanna make sure that you're eating, that you're drinking lots of water. Those are things that will help your milk come in better. It's okay to just kind of ignore some of the other things around you like laundry in a messy house. That stuff will get done down the road. And I bet if you're willing to, you probably would have some family or friends who'd be willing to help with that. And it's okay to accept their help. No one would feel any different of you. Let's see, sorry about that. There we go. Um, and if you do have children, pets, just try to set a little time aside from them because it's a big change for everyone getting used to a new baby at home and they will feel it too. So even if it's just, you know, a few minutes several times throughout the day or time for a special activity or reading a book or playing with a pet, sometimes that makes a huge difference. And in those cases too, it's okay to ask for family and friends help to take the dog for a walk or take your other child to the park. Um, anything just to kind of make them feel involved. Most of the time you'll have your first doctor's visit day or two after you go home from the hospital, especially if um, you're a breastfeeding mom. 
We want to make sure milk is coming in because usually the breast milk is not in when you go home from the hospital. So we want to make sure it's coming in, that the baby's getting enough um, to drink. We, that's where we kind of watch that weight loss or weight gain. We make sure feeding's going okay, um, and we watch for jaundice also. And a lot of times this can be a really important visit also. Um, I know with children's physicians, we have access to lactation consultants outside of the hospital. And so a lot of the hospitals do offer visits with lactation consultants um, through kind of their hospital. Children's physicians also have access to lactation consultants um, within our, our group. So we can pretty closely monitor how breastfeeds go, breastfeeding is going um, and get you hooked up to any other services that we might need help with. The first kind of official visit is when they're two weeks old. That's not to say they might not have been into the clinic two, three, or four times before their two-week visit, um, but kind of their first big official visit is really the two-week visit. Like I said, all babies lose weight after they're born, but should have regained whatever they lost by the time they're two weeks old. So if they were seven pounds when they're born, they should at least be seven pounds when they're two weeks old. Um, they may need to come in and see us after that time as well if they're still having any feeding issues or weight gain issues. But usually as long as they're back to birth, their, their weight, you know, when they were born and they're eating pretty good, then they are usually good to go until they're two months old, which is the first um, big visit. We start immunizations at that visit normally. And then really they're seen at two months, at four months, six months, nine months, a year. So they're seen pretty often, um, especially the first two years of life. The other things we kind of talk about too when babies are little, and especially at that two-week visit, is signs of illness. Babies, when they're born, their immune system is pretty, pretty immature. They do get some antibodies from mom, whether or not you breastfeed, just because some of that is passed through the placenta before the baby is born. Um, if you are breastfeeding, babies do get antibodies continually passed through the breast milk, so they get a little extra protection there. But definitely babies um, can get sicker faster, and we just need to monitor them and make sure they're doing okay. Definitely things to think about is if a baby has a temperature greater than 100.4, doing like using a rectal thermometer, that's a sign that something's not right and the baby needs to be evaluated. If they're sleepy all the time, where before they were waking up, eating great, now they're sleeping all the time, you can't get them to eat, that's usually a sign that they're getting sick. If they are super, super, super fussy and they weren't before, that can be a sign. Um, a fontanelle is that soft spot on the baby's head, so if you were to notice that the soft spot all of a sudden goes from being flat and nice and soft to like, you know, kind of tent it up and you can't push it down, that's a sign um, that the baby needs to be checked out. If they're looking more yellow in their skin, they're not peeing or pooping very well, um, all of a sudden they start getting really spitty and this, you know, the spit ups aren't just the normal burp, spit up, you know, it's like growing across the room, their spit ups, that's something that the baby should be checked out for um, and then any blood in the stool. Thankfully, this stuff doesn't happen too terribly often, but it's always um, always a risk and not something that I bring up to worry parents for, but definitely one of those things where you kind of get to know what your baby's norms are. You know how their disposition is by that point, their feedings, their pooping their wet diapers. Um, so when it's things that are really big out of the ordinary, that's something to call your doctor about just to kind of make sure everything's okay. People love babies, and so I'm sure you will all get lots of requests for visitors. Visitors can bring illnesses, just as, you know, people in the family too, so just make sure everybody washes really, hand, really good hand, you know, wash their hands really well before holding baby, touching baby, interacting with baby, and if they're sick at all, I really would just encourage them to stay away. If it's one of those things where it's a grandparent, you know, extenuating circumstances, they absolutely have to see the baby, then I would just kind of keep their distance. I wouldn't let them kiss them or hold them. Um, but really, everybody washes hands good. And it's okay to 
say to family as well, I think they're ready to eat or baby just fell asleep. I'm exhausted. I'm going to lay down or I'm sorry, baby really needs to feed. Can you come back later? It's okay to say those things. There's going to be plenty of time to interact and see this baby. Um, and I hate for you guys to get stressed out more by having to kind of worry about keeping your visitors entertained um, or not wanting to hurt anyone's feelings. So it's okay to, um, you know, say now is not, not a great time. Um, they will understand in the long run. Diapers. So the first week of life or so, um, we don't necessarily expect quite as many diapers, or at least the first several days. Most babies who are one day old, we're happy if they have one wet diaper and maybe and one poopy diaper. When the baby's two days old, we like for them to have two wets, two poops. And, you know, by the third day old, three wets, three poops. After that, then they really rapidly pick up. So the first, the first day, it's okay if they only have one or two diapers. That's not, it's not a problem. It's not something to worry about. They, babies' tummies are pretty small when they're, when they're born. So they're not necessarily going to take in a whole lot. Um, after that first week, they should have at least eight to 10 wet diapers a day. Poops in the hospital initially are something called meconium. It's the black, sticky, tarry, hard to clean poop that stick to the baby's butt. Those, um, they should have at least one poop during their, their first 24 hours of life. If they don't, then we go into looking for other reasons as, you know, as to why they don't. But as long as they're not more than 24 hours old and they have one poop, we're good to go. As baby's eating more, milk's coming in, they're getting more, um, more fluids, the stools change from kind of the dark green sticky stuff to the more the soft, the yellow, seedy, typical baby stools. Formula fed stools will maybe have poop one, two times a day. Breast fed babies initially will have a poop sometimes eight to 10 a day, sometimes after every time that they eat, just because they, they get so much of what they need from the breast milk that um, their poops are usually yellow, seedy, and sometimes a little watery. After a few weeks of having frequent poops like that, Sometimes then breastfed babies kind of flip the opposite way and sometimes will go days without having a poop, which is all normal in breastfed babies and definitely something um, that the nurses in the office and the pediatrician will be able to help make sure everything's okay. Babies are born not necessarily knowing how to poop like we do. So they don't know that they have to relax down there and push at the same time in order to poop. So you will hear them grunting. They will turn red. That is normal as they try to figure things out. And they might do that for months. As long as the poop is liquid, soft, mushy, and not hard pebbles, they are not constipated. So that's pretty normal. And some babies are just noisier than others. You always want to place the baby on their back to sleep. The biggest thing we worry about these with these babies is SIDS, which is the sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and aside from that, suffocation. Babies are not strong enough to move their heads away from something that gets in front of their face. So you always want to make sure that they're on their back on a firm surface, so not sleeping on an adult bed or a soft couch. Um, and all they need is just kind of the standard sheet on the mattress. I wouldn't do bumper pads, big blankets, pillows, stuffed animals. If they're swaddled, that's okay, as long as the swaddling is not near their face. Um, and most swaddling blankets, babies really like, you know, to be cozy, and some of them have the Velcro that keeps them in place. Or you can still use the general, you know, receiving blanket too and just kind of get it tucked under nice around them. Um, but really, that's definitely the safest safest place for them to be sleeping is on their back. And SID is, SIDS is really kind of the unexplained death of an infant younger than a year. Most happen between ages two and four months. Definitely sleeping on the back has decreased its incidence. Um, and sleeping on just kind of a firm mattress. 
And you want to make sure too that the baby's warm enough but not overheated as well because they don't sweat very good um, kind of their first year of life so they're not able to get rid of excess body heat like we are. So typically um, a baby is good with if they're going to be swaddled in like a sleep sack, you can just have a onesie on in the sleep sack, you know, and then then put in the sleep sack. If they're going to be swaddled in like a little receiving blanket, it's okay to have like a little like a little sleeper on them. Is okay. Um, I usually tell my families it's okay to have the air on, you know, in the in the summer. You want to keep it comfortable for you, and then you can kind of adjust your baby either with more clothes or less clothes, depending upon. Um, how warm or cold it is in your house. Smoking increases the risk of SIDS, so I definitely encourage no smoking. Um, sometimes it's harder to say than done, so oftentimes um, I will say smoking only outside, never ever in the house, never ever in the car, and have a separate like smoking jacket or change your clothes after you're done. Um, pacifiers actually been shown to decrease the risk of SIDS. So if you have a baby who likes their pacifier, it's okay to sleep with it. And doing tummy time when they're awake just to get those neck muscles strengthened up can be really um, uh, a decrease in the risk of SIDS as well. Babies when they're little, little, baths every two to three days is just fine. Once their belly button cord falls off, you can kind of do a full bath, otherwise just sponge baths until then. Most babies do not get that dirty. Um, you want to keep the water heater at 120 degrees or less just to kind of decrease the risk of burns if the water would be put on hot um, and you didn't know it. You want to use gentle soap, gentle washcloths. Baby skin is very, very sensitive, especially the first few years of life. So sometimes an adult soap is too abrasive. Um, adult laundry detergent sometimes is too abrasive um, and so I just kind of get in the habits usually the baby the baby shampoo the baby um, soaps are pretty good laundry detergents you don't necessarily have to do draft but usually I recommend like free and clear laundry detergents for these babies and even the parents close to just because their skin is so sensitive um, and some babies have more kind of rash issues than others which I think I will talk about and then trimming nails can be very hard in these little ones, but they like to scratch their face, they like to grab things. Um, so definitely trying to keep their nails trimmed as short as you can, and you can even file them if it's too hard to clip them. A lot of babies are bitters, which is very normal. We see it all the time. Um, babies are bitters because they're swallowing to the esophagus meets the stomach and there's a sphincter that connects the esophagus to the stomach and in babies it is a little on the loose side which is normal that's just kind of the way it is and so it allows more things to come out of the stomach up into the esophagus and then sometimes can come out of the mouth as these babies get older and children get older that sphincter um, tightens so that you don't have as much reflux issues when the kids are a little bit older um, so babies is very common we have those that are called happy spitters, and then kind of the spitters that worry us more. The happy spitters are babies who spit up, but they're happy, they're smiling, they're eating, they're gaining weight, they're growing, they're doing awesome. We don't worry about those babies much at all. Um, we wanna make sure that they're not getting overfed and that their tummies are just too full and can't handle the excess milk, and that's why they're spitting up. Um, making sure they get burped really good, um, Sometimes it helps having those babies either be held more upright or sit more upright for a while after they eat just to kind of let gravity keep the stuff in their tummy. We only really, really, really worry if they're not gaining weight, if they're so horribly fussy, if they are real archy with their back, they refuse to eat, um, or the vomiting is truly projectile, meaning it comes out of their mouth, it doesn't hit you, and it hits across the room. That's more worrisome. Or if it's bright yellow, bright green, those may be signs of other things going on. 
Lots of babies are fussy at times too when they're little. And so you almost kind of have to figure out maybe what's going on, why they're fussy. Are they hungry? Are they uncomfortable? Do they just have some gas, dirty diapers? Do they need some swaddle time? Do they need to be cuddled? Are they tired? Um, colic can be a pretty common, common um, issue too. Usually colicky babies um, are more fussier in the evenings. Um, it can start three or four weeks of age, peaks at two months is usually gone by three months. Um, and these babies are often fussy for three plus hours a day. Like I said, usually in the evenings, um, not necessarily a formula issue for formula fed babies, but a pediatrician kind of, kind of can help kind of sort through some of that stuff. But babies definitely when they're little and they're new, they like to be swaddled. They like to be bundled. They like to be warm. They are used to hearing heartbeats inside mom. They're used to hearing mom's tummy gurgling. So sometimes some babies like more noise than others. Um, so even having a white noise machine um, if they're sleeping or around sometimes can help. And the same with kind of the, the shushing noises or the singing. Um, some babies like to be on their sides more than flat on your back. So you just kind of have to experiment with that. Some babies just like to suck as well. So that's where a pacifier may or may not come in handy. And really, you can't spoil a baby in the first first few months of life. So you're not going to overhold them. You're not going to overcoddle them. You're not going to overcuddle them. Um, when they're older, yes, that can that can lead to bad habits, but not when they're little. They're little, little. And never ever shake a baby. Sometimes if they're crying and you don't know what's going on, as long as you know they are fed, they have a clean diaper. There's nothing that you can tell that is physically hurting them. And they are so crazy fussy that you're at what's end, you don't know what to do. It's okay to lay them in a safe place, whether it's in their crib, um, buckled into a swing or a bouncer seat, and walk away for a few minutes and kind of re regain your composure. There's nothing wrong with that. We've all been there. Um, just never, ever, ever shake your baby. Other common concerns we see a lot, goopy eyes. Babies are very prone to getting black tear ducts. The tear ducts are what um, go between the eye and the nose. Um, and so a lot of babies will get some tearing. Some will have mattering with it. Um, massaging the tear duct often helps with that during diaper changes numerous times a day, just kind of massaging that area there, kind of in the corner of the, corner of the eye. Black tear ducts usually resolves by a year of age. Those babies don't need surgery. They don't need anything else. Sometimes if the eye is getting um, more red or a little bit swollen, we will do some drops just to kind of calm that down a little bit. But for the most, for the most part, it's kind of a benign, although annoying um, issue with babies. Girls can have vaginal discharge, so it's not something to worry about the first week or two if you're changing the diaper and notice some discharge. It can be white, it can be pink, it can be red. Babies get hormones from mom. And so babies can kind of have almost a mini period as they withdraw from hormones after birth. So it's nothing to be concerned about unless it's really excessive or a lot. And then I would just double check with your pediatrician. But most of the time, it's not a problem at all. Babies do lots of movements when they're little. They have normal reflexes when they're born. So kind of the startle where they, where they kind of go like that with their arms. Um, that's very normal and common. And we want to see them doing some of these. If you put something in their mouth, they're gonna suck, no matter what. Um, they will grab onto your finger and not let go if it's there. If you put them in the air, sometimes they will act like they're taking steps. Those are all normal things that they should be doing when they're born. All little babies, their eyes cross. It's normal until six months. We don't worry about it until that point. They kind of will do jerky movements. Um, they get lots of sneezes when they're little. They get lots of hiccups. Things to bring up to your doctor though is if the movements really are truly rhythmic or involve like one arm, not both, um, or if the baby is very floppy and kind of limp, or on the flip side if they're stiff, if you can have a baby like this, pick them up and their arms and legs, you know, are like that, that may be concerning as well. Rashes are very, very common in the newborn period and for sometimes the first six months to a year. Um, and like I said, their skin is very sensitive. So just kind of keeping in mind what sort of products you put on them or you use in the household. 
We watch for thrush, which can be some white spots in their mouth. Um, and if those happen, the doctor needs to treat those. Some babies have kind of funny breathing, but it's actually normal breathing, and they sound congested after they're born. Some babies will do this, do this thing called periodic breathing where they breathe really fast a few times, and then they'll breathe slow, and then they'll breathe fast, and they'll breathe slow. That's totally normal. As long as the baby's color is good, they're acting otherwise normal, that's completely, completely common. Usually goes away after the first few months. A lot of babies sound congested after they're born too because they lived in fluid for nine months. So it just takes their nose a little while just to kind of get used to everything. Um, having some, some nasal saline drops at home um, is good to have around in case they get super, super stuffy and then you can kind of clear out their nose and you'll get the little bulb sucker, the syringes at the hospital, um, which work much better than the ones you can buy in the store. Things I kind of want you to remember too is there are no super questions when it comes to your baby. So I never want a family to feel like they can't ask any questions because they won't, you know, they don't want to seem like they don't know what they're doing or that they're stupid questions. Um, we've all been through there. The pediatrician's office is a phone call away. We have um, extended hours, so a lot of nights we're in clinic till seven, and we have great nurse triage lines available in the middle of the night. So there's always someone to talk to. Um, lactation consultants are available, um, which can be very helpful for a breastfeeding mom. And just remember babies don't always follow the rules. So you just kind of have to, as well as you can, kind of, kind of get to know your baby's general patterns and habits and ask for help or you know, call if baby's really deviating from kind of their normal, their normal stuff. And it's okay to put them down if you need to for a little while. It's all right. Um, and make time for yourselves. The time goes by really fast and sometimes can be a strain on relationships. So you definitely have to make um, a concerted effort, even if it's, okay, baby's asleep for, you know, a half hour. And just sharing a quick meal, talking about the day, seeing how things are going, you know, just still kind of trying to make some time for yourselves as well. What questions do we have? Any? You mentioned draft. Uh -huh. How long do you use that? And I'd never heard of that before. It's just one um, specific laundry detergent brand. Um, I personally like just like the free and clear stuff myself. So they're a little cheaper. Um, and it's just more of a gentle detergent. It's not going to have the dyes, the fragrances, all of that stuff in it because definitely babies can be very sensitive to dryer sheets, fabric softeners. So I tell a lot of my families don't even use any of that stuff and you don't want to use it in your clothes as well. So usually I kind of recommend just a gentle laundry detergent for the whole family to use and anybody who's going to be around the baby a lot because grandparents especially love to hold those little babies up on their shoulders and then the babies are rubbing their face in, um, you know, on the family's clothing or your clothing um, and they're just so sensitive. So I, I really like the free and clear ones myself. but. And some families use the regular stuff and have no issues whatsoever. And if that's the case, that's totally fine. Um, but a lot of babies get rashes. So that's kind of always the first thing I think of if babies do get rashes is just kind of to watch um, some of the dyes and fragrances and perfumes and some of that kind of in everyday soaps and detergents and lotions and all that. Well, I'll be here for a few minutes, so if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, best of luck to all of you. This is so exciting, and it goes by so, so fast. So kind of just, yeah, enjoy every moment, and I always say take lots of pictures, because at one point, it's hard to remember what they were like when they were that little. So, well, thank you all for coming out. Enjoy the rest of your night.